Welcome. I'm so glad you have decided to join me as we are preparing our hearts in this Advent season for the arrival of our Savior. I'm about to read you a Christmas story set in my home state of Georgia. It's about a family who figured out how to bring the hope, peace, joy, and love to someone into their community. Now, I hope you're sitting with somebody near you that you cherish and that you can enjoy this story together as I read Johanna's First Christmas. My name's Reese. As the oldest son of Stuart and Jillian O'Hara, I grew up right here in St. John's Landing in an old house that's been the roof over three generations of O'Hara's. I left home long enough to go to school, but salt water runs in my veins and I need to wake up to the smell of the marshlands and to the sound of waves and seagulls. So after college, I came home to St. John's Landing and bought a little cottage out on the point. Nothing spacious like the old house I grew up in, but I can breathe at the salt air and I have plenty of landscapes to paint. It's the weekend before Christmas and Mama's gathering room looks like someone dumped last year's Christmas on those weathered wood floors. Actually, it's not only last year's Christmas, it's nearly two decades of Christmases. Now, Mama's already decorated the eight-foot fur in the front of the picture window in the living room. She says that tree's for the town folk to see. But no one decorates what Mama calls the family tree until all her little birds return to the nest. There'll be 14 of Mama's little birds this year coming from all directions to put our baby's first Christmas ornaments on the small tree by the fireplace in the kitchen. Mama made an ornament for each of us, that is, each of us except Johanna. And this is her story. An unusually cold and rainy December followed a boisterous hurricane season for the folks of St. John's Landing back in 1986. Chiseled into the flat coastal landscape of Georgia, this town had little protection from the gale-like winds still blowing at midday on that Sunday before Christmas. Mama, Daddy, Riley, and I came out of the church holding tight to our hats and scarves. Seems in all the rushing around, no one gave notice to the young woman in the brown trench coat next to the lamp post. I saw her though. Strands of her blonde hair blew across her trench coat and into her face. She tried to tuck them into the gray hoodie she wore underneath her coat while she held tightly to the bundle covered in a red plaid wool blanket. She walked past us as we hurried to the car. I watched her through the car window when she started up the sidewalk to the front door of the church. She climbed the steps and gripped the brass doorknob. It was locked. So she turned around and walked away. Daddy took a left turn out of the parking lot onto Second Avenue and asked Mama, So Jillian, what's for lunch today? Before Mama could say anything, I yelled, Slow down, Daddy! Wait, Daddy, stop! Daddy slammed on brakes and looked around for some potential catastrophe. What in the world, Reese? Look, Daddy, look on the corner, that lady. I think she needs a ride. She looks really cold. I'll crawl over in the back and give her my seat. Daddy looked out his window and said, Mm, that's thoughtful, Reese, but we're only going six blocks down the street to our house. That would hardly be worth the effort. She knows where she's going. Daddy drove away slowly. I tried again. But Daddy, she's standing out there in the cold. Mama turned around. Well, maybe she's waiting on someone, Reese. 
I'm sure she'll be just fine. And besides, that roast in the oven won't wait much longer. I watched the woman as long as I could see her. She sat down on the sidewalk bench and hovered over her bundle. The wind was blowing, but at least the sun was shining. I can still smell Mama's roast and onions when we walked in the back door. And in a matter of minutes, the aroma of hot buttered rolls followed Mama to the dining table. Now, on a regular Sunday, we could change clothes before we ate lunch, but not today. Mama said this Sunday's lunch was dress rehearsal for the family Christmas dinner just two days away. She put all the food on the table and Daddy picked up my little brother, swung him around a couple of times before perching him atop a stack of pillows in his chair. Mama sat down and asked, must you do that, Stuart? Remember what we're doing here. Daddy didn't respond and turned to me. Reese, why don't you say grace for us today? Yes, sir. We all bowed our heads and I prayed. Dear God, thank you for this food. Thank you that Daddy has a job and we can afford a house and food to eat. And thank you that Mama knows how to cook. And God, please bless that lady on the street corner. I think she needs you. Amen. Mama sat there, a little puzzled, looking at us all dressed up at the table, saying how proud she was of her men. You could see it. A sense of pride radiated from her like a melody emanates from a violin. She rose from her chair and walked around the table. Napkins, everyone. Riley, sit up straight now and let's tuck your napkin in just like I taught you. She stood beside my four-year-old brother and let him wrestle with his own napkin. And then she smoothed his red curls away from his shirt collar. The curls that should have been trimmed months ago, but Mama just couldn't bear to see them gone. Riley, if you do well today, and there's no gravy on your tie when you finish, you'll have your own seat at the Christmas dinner table with the whole family. But Daddy has gravy on some of his ties, Riley quipped. Daddy grinned. Can't argue with that, son. Maybe I should join you at the children's table in the kitchen come Christmas. Mama chuckled, and we began passing dishes to the left and serving our plates. I was spot on to help my younger brother. Daddy looked at Riley. All right, Mr. Funny Guy. What did you learn in Sunday school today? Riley grinned. Mr. Vince told us Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a manger. Mama dabbed at her mouth with her linen napkin. But you already knew that, Riley. We read about that at home, so did you learn anything new? Mr. Vince said Jesus was born in a house of bread. I was quick to correct my brother. No, Riley, Jesus wasn't born in a house of bread. That's just what Bethlehem means, house of bread. I wish I was born in a house of bread, especially if there's lots of butter and some of Mama's mayhaw jelly. Riley just put more butter on his roll. Oh, and then we found baby Jesus. Mama gave Daddy the you better not laugh look and said, well, that certainly sounds interesting. Riley kept smearing butter and telling his story. Mr. Vince and Miss Angie helped us all make crowns out of cardboard, and we glued on sparkly stuff to make them look fancy, because we were going to be kings. Then Mr. Vince held up this tinfoil star on a stick, and we followed him all around the church, everywhere he went. He said, you have to be quiet. But Melissa... Oh, she squealed real loud when we found baby Jesus. I don't know why she squealed. It was just an old plastic doll. It was no baby Jesus. 
I don't think that was the point, Riley. Mama looked at his shirt sleeve, freshly dipped in gravy, but decided to say nothing about it. Anyway, I'm glad you know the story. It will make this evening's carol seem more meaningful to you. Riley said, I just hope Melissa got all her squealing done this morning. That girl can really squeal. We kept eating and nobody except me saw the gray hooded woman with the red plaid bundle walking slowly down the sidewalk and looking in our dining room window as she passed. After lunch, Riley and I played video games upstairs and Daddy was in his office getting a head start on his year-end reports. The afternoon sun stretched its fingers through those near century old window panes. So Mama curled up on the window seat like a cat and took a nap after she finished wrapping the presents. When the grandfather clock and the foyer struck five, we put on our warmest sweaters and jackets and decided to walk the six blocks down 2nd Avenue to the church for the carol scene. Riley pitched a fit to wear his brown beanie with stuffed wool antlers sewn on each side, so Mama let him. We all gathered in the basement of the church where Pastor Franklin handed out Christmas carol booklets and asked everybody to gather their family members and head outside to the manger scene on the front lawn of the church. For the next 45 minutes, we would be singing and the violin players from Savannah would be playing. Next to the lighting of the Christmas tree out at the lighthouse, this was St. John's biggest Christmas event, a live nativity and carol sing. Riley and I stood right in front of Mama and Daddy. I sang every note because I like to sing but Riley mostly fidgeted, singing only the few choruses he knew because Christmas music's been playing at the O'Hara house since Thanksgiving. His little green eyes followed the star dangling from the oak tree and bouncing from limb to limb in the strong wind. Finally, the wind quieted and the star was still. Riley's eyes went straight to the manger and he started tugging on my jacket sleeve. I looked down at him and kept singing. Star of wonder, star of might, star with royal beauty bright. Riley leaned forward, pointed at the manger and whispered, Look, it's baby Jesus. I nodded and agreed with him and just kept on singing, never missing a beat. Riley was about to topple over, floppy antlers and all, and pulled on my sleeve again. This time, he whispered louder. Look, Reese, it's the real baby Jesus. That's when Mama yanked gently on the red curls sticking out from under his beanie cap and put her hand on his shoulder to keep him still. About that time, Mrs. Crenshaw stepped out of the group of carolers. Her husband was right behind her with a folding chair and an auto harp. I wasn't sure that folding chair was going to hold her up. I heard Daddy say one time Mrs. Crenshaw had a wide girth. But she took her seat beside the manger, placed the auto harp in her lap, and began strumming. Mama said this was the one night of the year when Mrs. Crenshaw just lived for it, when the whole town would be listening to her. She probably had thoughts that the winds might even carry her voice out to sea where the sailors would just be spellbound. Sweet little Jesus boy, Born long time ago. Mrs. Crenshaw's been singing that song to the good people of St. John's Landing longer than most folks can remember. 
Riley had no concern for Mrs. Crenshaw's singing aspirations. He could not be stilled or silenced any longer. Just as Mrs. Crenshaw was singing, Our eyes was blind, we couldn't see. We didn't know who you was. Riley broke loose. He broke loose from Mama's grip and ran to that manger and let out his own high-pitched squeal. It's baby Jesus, the real one. He showed up under the star for Christmas. The whites of Mrs. Crenshaw's eyes grew larger as she looked at Riley. And then she rotated her head to search the chorus of singers for Mama. She just sang louder over Riley's shrieking. Look, everybody, it's really baby Jesus. Riley squealed again and started jumping up and down, his stuffed antlers flopping from side to side. Then he froze. Holy cow! There's two of them, and one of them is real, really real. Then came the jumping up and down routine again. Everybody was looking around at each other and trying to see into the crash. Daddy raced around behind the manger scene and came in from the other side to get to Riley. He had no interest in upsetting Mrs. Crenshaw even more by walking in front of her. He knelt and took Riley by his shoulders, trying to quiet him. Look, Daddy, it's really baby Jesus. He's moving. That's no plastic doll, like Reese said. Daddy looked. Then he whispered, Oh, my. It is a real baby. Mrs. Crenshaw's voice was almost a whisper by now. Sweet little holy child, and we didn't know who you was. Daddy crawled on his knees to reach into the manger. Riley was right at his elbow, looking over Daddy's shoulder. When Daddy took the baby in his arms like he used to with Riley, the baby started crying. See, Daddy, I told you it was baby Jesus. I knew it was him. But I didn't know baby Jesus cried. Pastor Franklin made a beeline to the manger. When Mrs. Crenshaw strummed the last chord, Pastor Franklin announced, well, Riley, I'm glad you recognized the baby, and I'd say this baby Jesus stole the show tonight. Everybody started clapping and looking at each other, and then things got real quiet. The pastor seized the silence and asked, Is the mother of this beautiful child here? We all looked around to see if anyone would claim the baby. No one did. Then the pastor whispered something in Daddy's ear. No one paid attention to the lady in the brown trench coat, but I saw her. She just walked away into the darkness. Daddy took Riley's hand and started toward the side door of the church. He nodded at Mama and me and motioned for us to join him. Mrs. Franklin, the pastor's wife, was right behind Mama. When we got to the pastor's study, Mrs. Franklin removed her coat and tossed it across her husband's desk chair and turned to Daddy. Here, Stuart, let me see that child. I have four sons and a whole herd of grandchildren. I don't know much, but I do know what to do with a baby. Daddy gladly gave that squalling infant to Mrs. Franklin. We stood beside them, lined up like choir boys and just stared at that bundle she was holding. Mama eased the blanket away from the baby's face and said, oh, its little cheeks are so red, probably from the wind and the cold. I sure hope it's not from fever. Here, let's put him down. 
Mama grabbed the green chenille pillow from the sofa across the room and put it on top of the pastor's desk. Mrs. Franklin gently laid the baby on the pillow and began to unwrap him just like he was her last Christmas present. This is unbelievable, she said. We haven't had a baby born in this parish in the last three months. I know Jenny Walton is in the family way, but her baby isn't due until March. I don't understand this. If you don't want your baby these days, all you have to do is leave it at the fire station. So who in the world would put a newborn baby in the manger outside on a night like this and just walk away? Something terrible's going on here. I just feel it in my bones. I squirmed and spoke up. I know. I know who did it. Mrs. Franklin stopped unwrapping her Christmas surprise. All eyes turned toward me and I could feel my face turning red just like that baby's. Daddy spoke. Son, you don't know who the mother of this baby is. Yes, I do, Daddy. Mama leaned down and looked me in the eye. Reese, you don't know any such thing. This is nothing to be choking about. I'm not joking, Mama. I know who she is. It's the woman in the brown trench coat. Mama turned to Mrs. Franklin. I'm so sorry, Edith. I think Reese reads too much. He has quite the imagination. Mama, I am not imagining this. I saw her. Daddy put his hand on my shoulder and turned me around. What do you mean you saw her? Did you see her put the baby in the manger? Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. I mean, I didn't see her put the baby in the manger, but I saw her this morning outside the church. I grabbed the corner of the red plaid blanket. See, she was holding something wrapped in this, but I didn't know it was a baby. While I was giving them a description of the woman, Riley got loose and squirmed between Mama and Mrs. Franklin. When nobody was paying attention to him, he got to the baby and started peeling away the plaid blanket and the thin flannel sheets underneath. Just when I was reminding Daddy that he had refused to give the woman a ride after church this morning, Riley squealed again. Holy cow! It's not baby Jesus! It's a girl, a girl. Look, Mama. Mama rushed to see. What? How do you know it's a girl? She's dressed in pink, Mama, and she's got on a bracelet. She's smiling at me. Pastor Franklin walked in about that time carrying a quilted bag and said that he had called the police. He joined us around the desk to get a closer look. Then Mama started asking one question after another. Why would a mother abandon her child? What will happen to this baby now? Who's going to take the baby home and take care of her? Riley never moved from in front of that bundle on the chenille pillow. It was like he was spellbound or something. He didn't hear a word until Mama asked the last question. Who was going to take care of the baby? That's when Riley spoke up. Mama, she's mine. I found her. Mama spoke softly. She's not yours, Riley. When Daddy found Lucky, we got to keep him. Mama stepped in. Yes, Riley, but Lucky was a decrepit old dog. This is a baby. I know, Mama, but I take good care of Lucky every day. You know I do. And you know what we say, finders keepers. Two police officers came in while all the adults in the room were trying to convince Riley that finders keepers has nothing to do with discovering a baby in a manger on a cold night in December. The baby began to cry again. Mama picked up the baby off the pillow, 
red plaid blanket and all. This baby's hungry. No way to know how long she's been lying in that manger. We need to get some formula and some diapers. Pastor Franklin raised the quilted bag he carried and looked at his wife. Maybe you should look in here. We found this in the crash after you left. Looks like a baby bag to me. Here, give me that. Mrs. Franklin took the bag from her husband, opened it, and started pulling out its contents. Somebody who loves this baby came prepared. We have formula, we have diapers and wipes, we have medicine, and here's an envelope and a note clip to it. She handed the pale pink envelope to her husband. Here, see what it says. The pastor removed the note and unfolded it and began to read. It says, I have left my baby with you because I have no other choice. I leave her with you because I love her so much and want her to have a good life. I thought you good people at the church would be the best ones to figure that out. I have no home, no responsible family, little education, no steady job, and nothing to offer her but my truest love. That's why I leave her with you. Please keep the other pink envelope for my little girl and give it to her when she's old enough to understand. Please, please help her know I didn't abandon her. I did the only thing I knew to do. The letter will tell it all. It is my story and her father's. May God take care of her. Then there's a, there's a name on the other envelope. Looks like the baby's name is Johanna. Mama was crying by then. Officer Davis looked at his watch. Pastor, we have to call this in. This is child abandonment and we have to get in touch with Child Protective Services. Mrs. Franklin stepped in. Just you wait a minute, Drew. It's Sunday night and Christmas is coming in two days. You heard what this young mother said. She left the baby with us. We'll find a way to take care of her until we can figure this out. I understand, ma'am, but that's not how this works. Drew Davis, do you remember when I coached your little league baseball team? Oh, yes, ma'am, I do. You were the only woman coach in the league. They nearly laughed us all out of town until that miracle of a season we had. Mm-hmm. I thought you'd remember that, Drew. Well, guess what? This is the season of miracles, and we're waiting on one. So why don't you just turn around and walk right out of here like we never called you? Do you understand? Officer Davis looked at his partner. No use arguing with the coach. He moved toward the door. Yes, ma'am. You have until the day after Christmas for your next miracle, Coach Franklin. Pastor Franklin had the biggest grin. I guess he's seen his wife in operation before. So tell us, Edith, what kind of miracle you got up your sleeve this time? No miracle. Just plain old common sense. This woman loves this child and she's going to stick around to make sure we did what she asked. Then she looked at me. So tell me, Reese, you've seen this woman? You think you'd recognize her if you saw her again? Yes, ma'am, I would. Like I said, she had on a brown trench coat and she was tall and she had blonde hair. Mrs. Franklin looked dead straight at me. That's good, Reese. Aren't you out of school for the holidays? I squirmed. Yes, ma'am. Good. I'll pick you up at 8.30 in the morning. We're going for a ride around town, out to the docks and maybe over to the point. We'll find her. Mrs. Franklin turned to Mama. Now, Jillian, 
do you want to take this baby home so Riley can help you or do you want me to take her? Riley started his jumping up and down routine again. We'll take her, she's mine. Mama and Daddy looked at each other and just nodded their heads. Mama said, we'll take her, Edith, but I don't understand what you're up to in finding this woman. She obviously intends to give the baby up for adoption. That's what you think. What's obvious to me is she's the one asking for some help. She didn't leave her baby at the fire station. She left her at this church and we're going to find her and we're going to give her the help she needs. Then that baby will have her a mother, her own mother. Monday morning came and so did my day long ride with Mrs. Franklin. But there was no sign of the young woman in the brown trench coat. Tuesday came, Christmas Eve. Gale winds were blowing again and this time bringing in sheets and showers of rain. The church bells rang as families dashed into the church, folding their umbrellas and shedding their raincoats and taking their seats for the candlelight service. We sat on the third row on the organ side. Mama held Joanna, enjoying every moment, but there was some sadness in her eyes. I think Mama knew she was only guarding the treasure belonging to someone else. Riley sat beside Mama and just stared at the baby. I figured that the woman in the brown trench coat might just show up for this Christmas Eve service if she were still in town. So I fidgeted and swiveled in my seat for the first 45 minutes looking for the lady. No sign of her. The service was almost over and we were singing the last chorus. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for you. This time, when I turned around, there was someone standing in the shadows in the doorway. It was a brown trench coat and blonde hair that looked like spun gold in the candlelight. It was Johanna's mother. I whispered to Daddy and this time he listened. Daddy walked with purpose up the outside aisle. I'll just tell you this. Five of us came to church, but six of us went home after the service. It was the merriest of Christmas Eves at the O'Hara house. Not a loud, boisterous time, but one of quiet joy. Little Johanna and her mother, Annabeth, were our Christmas guests. Annabeth's story was like many more stories that Mama heard through the years. A story of growing up in a house where anger and pain and little to no love lived. Then she met John during her senior year. They were both working as part-time clerks in a grocery store and for the first time, she felt love and he understood her silent pain because John was escaping his own misery. They got married at 18 and John took a job on an offshore rig after graduation. Things were okay until Annabeth was notified of John's accidental death and three days later, she learned she was pregnant. She had wandered from place to place during the next few months, taking jobs where she could find them. But she had grown weary and afraid of what would become of her daughter. She prayed and prayed and found her answer in St. John's Landing on the sidewalk 
in front of the church. Anna Beth stayed at our house with baby Johanna and joined our family for Christmas. Riley sat up straight and tall at the Christmas dinner table with the grown-ups. After hearing Daddy read the Christmas story, Riley announced, Well, there might not have been room in the inn for baby Jesus, but I'm glad there was room in the manger for baby Johanna. There was room in the manger, all right. And Mama made room for Annabeth and baby Johanna at our house. The day after Christmas, they moved into the second floor apartment above our garage where they lived for the next two years until Annabeth finished nursing school. Mama nailed up a sign that said bird's nest above the apartment door. Over the next 20 years, Mama made that apartment a safe haven for 13 more girls with babies and stories like Annabeth's. She provided a nest until Mama and baby were ready to fly. Mama treated those girls like her own children and their babies like her grandchildren. That's why they still show up every Christmas all these years later to decorate the family tree, even Johanna. She was the only one of the babies that came through Mama's bird's nest that never got her baby's first Christmas ornament. But I have a surprise for Mama and Johanna and Annabeth this Christmas. I made her a hand-painted ornament of a baby wrapped in a red plaid blanket lying in a manger and underneath in bright gold letters, Johanna's first Christmas. I hope you will enjoy this Christmas season and I hope maybe this story will echo with you just a little bit longer and I wish you a most blessed Christmas. <music>